podcast for your career and your life, no matter what business you're in. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Northern Power Women podcast brought to you by b-herd.io. I'm Sam Walker. She's Simone Roche. (laughs) It's only eight o'clock in the morning here, Simone, here in Arizona, where we record. Uh, Four o'clock for you, of course, in Liverpool. I'm already stressed out. 8 a.m. Good start to the day, eh? (laughs) Well, it's a good job that it's Stress Awareness Month at the moment, isn't it? So. (laughs) Oh, good. Does that mean uh, this is the time to be stressed? Okay. Forget the other 11 months of the year. So, Stress Awareness Month. Do you know what? We need this because so many of us are carrying so much around on our shoulders every day. We need some help. You know, we like a poll, don't we? You know, we asked, how often do you feel stressed from working from home? Uh, We had every day, 33%, every few days, 42%, once a week, 22%, and never 8%. Wow. I don't believe the 8%. I'm not sure I believe that anyone is totally stress-free, uh, to be honest. But one of the things that I learned about this week is the stress bucket. Have you heard of the stress bucket? No. Is this something you kick against a wall when you're absolutely <laughs> furious and it's meant to make you chill out? What's the stress bucket? Well, to be honest, uh, Philly sent me a gif of somebody with a bucket on their head, holding it in their hands and banging it against a wall. And I'm like, yep, there's days where it does feel like that. Well, it is, as we said, it's Stress Awareness Month and uh, um, mentalhealth-uk.org have put a blog out about the stress bucket. And imagine there is a bucket that you carry with you Mm. and it slowly fills up when you experience different types of stress. And sometimes you feel awesome, don't you? And you feel like Wonder Woman and you can carry it all. I remember that day. I think it was a Wednesday. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But the thing is, it's important that you find activities which will help you lighten that load. And everyone has a different size bucket and everyone has different amount of water that is flowing through it. So the whole thing about the stress bucket is finding out what helps you reduce that stress and how can you keep the activities going when other pressures build up. So think about the stress bucket and you need to sort of think about the the tap, if you Mm. like, and what you need to let in or let out. So and if you if the bucket overflows, problems develop, if you like. So good coping is when the tap is working well and it's, it's coming out. Bad coping is when the tap is not working well. So I suddenly, uh, you know, this is the Northern Plumber Women <laughs> podcast, I think clearly uh, has happened. But I think I think it is important because, you know, there's no competition in how much work or how much stress or how many hours we carry. So I like this and I like it because there's a... Um, it's a visible representation to me. I'm not always good at reading lots of long articles, mm. but this is literally a bucket. Stress in the bucket, tap, tap gets blocked, doesn't empty out. That's where we start causing problems. So I think we all have to look at what goes in and what we have to let out. It's a negotiation, isn't it? And it's compromise. It is. And it's it's really difficult, I think, when your bucket's full and your tap is blocked and you're feeling completely overwhelmed, that is not the time to start thinking, how can my life be easier? You need to start thinking, how can my life be easier? Actually, when your bucket's pretty empty, because when it's full, there's not enough room in your brain to try and then to start to work out, hmm, how can I simplify things? There's a psychologist based in New York City called uh, Dr. Becky, and she's on Instagram, Dr. Becky at home. And she deals a lot, well, she deals mainly with children and families. And she does Instagram stories virtually every single day. She's got a new podcast coming out as well called Ask Dr. Becky, where people, and as I said, it's mainly parenting, but there's quite a lot of stuff that she's come from talking about relationships and talking about stress and talking about anxiety that I found really, really helpful. Living as I do in a house with three other people, two dogs, two cats, seven fish and a lizard, it's chaos. And I always joke and go, ha ha, my house is chaos. But actually I find it massively triggering and I really get stressed out this morning walking into my kitchen after I'd spent hours cleaning up yesterday to see literally a disaster zone in front of me my bucket Simone was at the brim by about 6 45 this morning and it's just it's so so difficult and one thing Dr Becky said and it sounds ridiculous saying it out loud but this has helped me a lot in the last few months is my house is a mess I am not a mess my kitchen is a disaster. I 
I'm not a disaster. Because I think when you're surrounded by absolute chaos, you take it on and it almost becomes you. And the and the chaos and mess around you, you're just like, ah! And I physically feel the burden of it on my shoulders as I'm just trying to make the packed lunches in the morning or get the dogs ready and just, you can't even find, I haven't found my car keys for four days and I'm not the person who loses things like that. So this is the level of disaster around my house. Um, and I found that really, really helpful. So if anyone has any more tips of when your bucket is full, what can you say to yourself at that moment to just start to empty that tap out a bit, turn that tap on? That would be really helpful. There's a link as well. There's a, there's a stress bucket workshop on this website as well. So whether it be rest and relaxation, talking to trusted people, doing something you enjoy, good time management, they're things that can add to sort of lightening that load. So let's all have a little look at that. And let's, it's Stress Awareness Month. So let's come back at the end of the month and see, see what yeah. our bucket looks like. I like that. Thank you very much indeed. We were talking last week, weren't we, about working from home? Not from the, the, the point of stress, but the idea of, OK, well, you're now at home. Your electricity bill's gone up because it's been through winter and it's been blooming cold. And you've had the heating on all day where you might have had your thermostat switch off at sort of 8.30 in the morning and come back on at four. We know that there's been uh, quite often people have had to take on extra broadband. You might have had to go and buy a decent chair so you're not sitting on your sofa or your, ki- you know, your kitchen chairs each day to s- sit and do your work. There has been extra expenses you've taken on as a household in order to work from home. Now, as we were discussing, it might be that, well, you've not had your commute, so therefore things have evened out in your pocket. But we were talking, weren't we, Simone, about whether or not is there a responsibility from your company to start paying you some expenses because they're not paying for their heating and lighting bills in their offices and yet you're paying for it. What what poll? Remind us of what results we got on our poll that we put out. Yeah, we said, have you received any compensation from your employer for your work from home costs? And the question was, should they mm. be covering the costs? So should your employer be covering the costs? 6% said they uh, their organisation had paid for everything. Wow. So only 6%. Gosh. Um, and they've covered quite a few costs as 21 one percent no I don't think um they should oh, it's 31 wow. percent but 42 percent says no they don't but I think they should so yeah no you know sort of so clearly mm. sort of they think they should should be there at 42 but not far yeah. behind was 31 percent I don't think they should but I think this goes to the fact isn't it it depends I think there is a um dependent on the size yeah. of your organization as well doesn't it and the the sort of the the flexibility the budget you know everything like that so yeah interesting one that we do like a double poll week this week I love a double poll week look at that we're all over the polls like a rash if there's a question about work that you would like us to ask the Northern Power Women Massive then do let us know of course you can get in touch on Twitter at North Power Women you can find us Northern Power Women on Instagram and LinkedIn as well or send us an email podcast at northernpowerwomen.com one one thing about working from home seeing as we're on that subject that (laughs) really struck me this week a couple of things is that um, I had quite a big project that I've been working on, Rap, this week. Well, we, we've just released this week a big podcast that I've been doing for a, for a business. And we've got kind of a big virtual get-together launch party, if you like, happening tomorrow. And one of the senior members of staff in the organisation I was making the podcast for sent me a message saying, you know, I've loved the fact, you know, it's been a long road that we've been on in this, you know, lots of ups and downs in terms of getting guests and problems and blah, blah, blah. I said, but, you know, we've come through it. And the most important thing is we've come through this friends. And I thought that's a really nice thing that she said there. And then it occurred to me, I've never met her and I probably never will (laughs) because it's not like you and me. Okay, we're not together now (laughs) recording this podcast, but we, you know, we were in the same country for three or four years. So obviously we do know each other really, really well. And I thought, huh, isn't it a funny world we're living in where we are actually making friends with people we've never met and will probably never, ever meet. And there's another company I work for here and then most of them are based in New York and I'm getting my second jab later on today so she'll, so we'll have it by the time this podcast released and I was chatting to them all on we have a virtual kind of production meeting on a Monday and I said oh guess what if all going well I'm going to come to New York in June at some point and um and Matt <laughs> one of the people in this organization said to me fantastic we're going to get a picnic together let's all have a great big reunion and in the park and we'll all have a big reunion together and then he went oh hang on 
we can't have a reunion because I've never met you. And again, and again, this is someone I've been working with for a year. <laughs> never met them. Never met them. Feel like I know them because we talk all the time on Zoom. And I thought, oh, what's it going to be like when we do actually meet? It feels suddenly a bit funny. And yet this is where business is going now, that we're having close business relationships with people we've never met, but we know. Well, I think of that with my own team. Um, I met Andy, um, one of our software developers. Yeah. I've met, you know, uh, Philly and Gina, you know, never met them. You know, we've never You've been... You've never in... met Philly no, and Gina? <gasps> no, And particularly Philly, I'm going to say this right now. I think we need to document this now. You know, Philly, we never met. She's got all my login details. She's got, <laughs> you know, my signature details. You know, we've never been met. And I'm sure they say, do not pass over the information um, to strangers. That you've never met on the internet, and look, this is a- Philly. What is that? Oh no, she can't fly anywhere yet. It's all right. She'll be in Rio though. As soon as she gets on a plane. <laughs> I know. It's, but it is. It's, it's funny, isn't it? The, the relationships that we build up because there's almost even these people we've never been in a room with. Mm. There's that weather chat. What's the background that you've got behind you? There's those icebreaker conversations that we didn't have on a phone call. Yeah. It's almost like a blaring, isn't it? It's a blend of what we would have had walking from the reception area to the meeting room. Those conversations, isn't it? Is you yeah. know, so, the, so you are, you, yeah, do you know I'm not that you are building up those relationships. So let's face it, we're Northern and we like to chat. We're always, we're going to build a relationship anywhere. <laughs> right. And I find that actually, and I, a few people have said to me after I've been working on projects, Oh, since you joined, you know, it just, just become a lot more chatty. And I thought it's because I'm from Manchester. It's because we don't <laughs> shut up. And I'm like, oh, what's that top you're wearing? That's a nice frock. Oh, I like your earrings. <laughs> and I think a lot of the kind of American corporate world were like, oh, Oh, okay. Uh (laughs) It's exactly like going on the tube in London where nobody speaks. Yes, right. In fact, we were on a call with Philly. It's it's the Philly episode, this one. But um, uh, Philly uh, was was heading out to a a beer garden and uh, uh, Northern Power Man was asking, how are you going to get there? She's like, I'm going to go on the tube. Um, Rob's like, I challenge you to speak to stranger on the tube. And she she looked across the Zoom call going, no, 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 that's not what we do. (laughs) That's not what we do. And I'm like, just tell them you're a northerner now. <laughs> do you know what was funny? And it's and I I lived in London for many years, and you know we're joking southerners because I'm I'm officially a Midlander, adopted northerner, but Midlander. And so uh, you know there are loads of lovely, lovely people in London. But I do remember being in Manchester and being uh, you know I'd lived there about ten years or so, and I was pregnant with my daughter, and I was very pregnant. And I was going down to London for some meeting and I was trying to get off the bus at Piccadilly train station in Manchester with this little bag I'd got. And about three people rushed forward. Oh, come on, love. Let me help you down those stairs. Come on, you're all right. Come on. And literally almost carried me onto the train because everyone was so looking after me. And I felt very, very loved and cared for. And then I got to London. (laughs) And as I got off the train in London, my bag, my little weekend bag, just tipped over and hit a man on the side of the leg as we were trying to get off the train. He turned around and he went, I'm going to sue you for that. And I was like, Welcome to London. <laughs> <laughs> We're joking. It must have been a one-off. It's a one-off. We know. We're just having a northern. We fight. are. We are. But I love it. <laughs> right. Should we get some life lessons going on, our Simone? I'm loving this week's. Tell us about Catherine. We've got Catherine Milan, and uh, those of you who may remember when we did our NPW Live campaign, Catherine was one of the featured talks, fantastic talks. So Catherine is a student recruitment and widening, widening participation officer at the University of Manchester, and she's working on creating equal access and student success in higher education. Here's Catherine's life lessons. Hi, my name is Catherine Millen and I am the Student Recruitment and Widening Participation Officer for Black, Asian and Minority Ethnic Young People at the University of Manchester. So when have you felt the fear and done it anyway? Um, I would say I definitely felt the fear the night before I was due to fly to South America by myself. Um, I remember ringing my best friend, really upset, really emotional, saying I can't do it, I can't do it. I'm going by myself. It was completely out of my comfort zone. And after about half an hour, she managed to kind of convince me to go. And I even remember that night I didn't sleep, getting on the flight. And for me, that was the first time where I genuinely felt scared. I was doing something for myself without any help or support from anyone and really going into the unknown but after a couple of days I was there like I absolutely like loved it and I think for me it definitely pushed me more 
to make me do things that I was scared of. What has surprised you about working life? I think the biggest surprise for working life for me is that it actually can be quite fun and rewarding. When I grew up, I just used to see people do jobs that they didn't necessarily like or had to to survive. And um, so for me, I always had this concept of work being something that was always a chore and it wasn't really fun. Um, and it was only kind of breaking the cycle of poverty that I came from that enabled me to go on to do a job that I love through staying on an education, going and getting a degree. And I guess just really pushing myself academically to ensure that I do a job that I love. Have you ever changed careers? Yeah, so when I was younger, just graduated from university, I actually started to work in child and adolescent mental health. I was quite passionate about this due to um, experiences of mental health from members within my own family. And I used to work um, with young people with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And I absolutely loved it. And back then I was like, yeah, this is the career that I want. I want to stay working in mental health. I found it really, really rewarding. On the flip side to that, I also absolutely loved and was really, really passionate about working in the field of equality and diversity. I was fortunate enough to uh, be a young ambassador on the Anthony Walker Foundation programme um, and going into schools and speaking to young people about equality and diversity and hate crime. And, you know, there was just something in me that felt really moved by that work. So a couple of years in, I kind of had to make a decision about what I wanted to do and um, kind of which field that I wanted to go into. I followed my heart and I decided to pursue a career that involves reducing inequalities within education. How did you ask for a pay rise? So quite recently, at the institute that I work now, I asked for a pay rise. It's a little bit different. It's not necessarily a pay rise, but it was more of a regrade, which essentially means that you do get paid more. I think the first thing that I kind of noticed and recognised was I was actually doing the job that was worth a pay, a pay rise um, and the work and stuff that was putting in, the, work, the level of work that I was doing. Um, I think I recognise that I should be paying more for it. I think that's really, really important to think when you're asking for a pay rise, you've got to know your worth. And then on top of that, you've got to be able to demonstrate it to your employer. And so it's no good just going to them and saying, well, I think I deserve a pay rise. You know, I went in there and said, I think I deserve a pay rise. Um, this is all the work that I've done. This is above and beyond what you're paying me. And just have that bit of confidence to enable them to see as an organisation or as a, as a business you're worth that additional investment. When have you made a difficult choice about your career? Um, so as I said earlier, I was fortunate enough to travel quite a lot in the early years of my career. And I travelled all over the world, South America, um, Africa, Southeast Asia. Um, and at the time I was doing um, humanitarian aid work that involved going into loads of different schools um, and working with young people with loads of different complex needs. And I absolutely loved it and that's where my passion for working within education came from. However, being overseas all the time, being away from my family, being away from my friends, it really kind of took a toll on my mental health. And I think there was always something inside of me that missed home or just missed having a base. So I decided uh, after three years of doing this work um, that I was going to actually return to the UK, but I was still going to stay working in education. Um, and it's quite interesting actually because my last post that I did, I was working for an NGO in Nigeria called VSO. I'm working in schools and it was actually in a hotel in Nigeria where I interviewed for the job that I'm doing now at the University of Manchester. And it was quite funny because we set, set up the interview over Skype and then the electricity went down and I had to do the rest of the interview over the phone. And yeah, luckily the university seen something in me, decided to take a chance and gave me the job and then it's the job that I'm doing today. And even though it was a difficult decision at the time to give up, you know, working in humanitarian aid, give up the travelling aspect of it, I knew, I know now that it was the right decision for me about making that choice about my career path. Thank you so much to Catherine for your absolutely superb life lessons. Do you know what I re I loved so much about what she said, but her little note there about a pay rise, about you've got to be able to demonstrate what your worth is to your employer. It's not just knowing what your worth is yourself, but demonstrating that to your employer. That's the really key fact. You might know that you are worthy of a pay rise. You've got to prove it to them. You've got to do that big sell to yourself. Some great advice there. It is. And um, I, I love this. And Catherine, as I say, was part of the campaign around Be Heard. And, you know, um, don't forget, please sign up to the Be Heard campaign. But one of the things that struck me, uh, because I think I felt the same, was, you know, when I grew up or when she grew up, she used, I used to see people people doing jobs that they didn't yeah. necessarily yeah. like yeah. but had to do 
you know, or multiple jobs, you know, and I think now we, we the, the aspiration, isn't it? Mm. Do what you love, mm. do what you love. And, you know, we can't always do that. And it's definitely not always been the case. So I thought that was, that really stood out for me because I remember thinking, gosh, that's exactly, I didn't know those things existed. 100%. And work was the thing that you had to get over in order to have fun in your life. And then I remember my mum saying to me, wait a minute, you're at work more than you're at home once you get to a certain age. So you better make sure it is something that brings you some sort of fulfillment and isn't something you just kind of ticking the clocks ticking down for but you know we're very lucky if we can do that and it doesn't mean that all day every day is marvelous we do still have those days where we think oh no this needs to be over thank you so much to the wonderful Catherine milan we'd love to hear from you of course podcast at northernpowerwomen.com just drop us a quick line and say life lessons please simone roche and sam walker i'd love to take part and then our brilliant team will let us know exactly what you need to do and hold your hand all the way and it's dead easy and we'd love to hear from you um you know Catherine's job is as I said working in student recruitment and widening participation for for BAME young people and I read an article this week which really struck me actually and it's from a woman called Mary Ibiyemi from Glasgow and she lost her job in a takeaway last year because her employer said he just couldn't keep her on anymore in the pandemic and what she's noticed is that for months and months and months she was looking for a job And she started to realize that a lot of her white friends were finding work a lot easier than her black and minority ethnic friends. And she said, one thing she really noticed was that for some people, having what she called a hard sounding name meant people were less likely to interview for a number of positions. And in fact, you know, it showed that, you know, UK jobless rates for young black people have risen by more than a a third to 35%. And it's 24% for young people of Asian descent and 13% for young white people. Now that doesn't mean that young white people aren't also having a hard time, but we're looking at 13% to 24 to 35. And I think Mary might be onto something here because I do remember years ago working for a company and we were looking for a receptionist and we were kind of going through CVs and one name came up and it was a a Nigerian name and the boss, without any malice (laughs) in in his voice, went, I don't know how to say that kind of a... And it just struck me. And this is a long time ago. And he didn't say it as, oh, I'm not having her. It was like, oh, no, I couldn't deal with that. And I was like, whoa, what? You've not met her. You might be a great candidate. He was like, oh, no, I, 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 I couldn't say it. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't know how to say a name. And that oh my God. really came back to me when I read this article from Mary Ibiemi, and I thought something as simple and as silly as looking at a name on a piece of paper and saying, "Oh, I don't really know how to say it. Therefore, I don't want to call them for interview because I don't want to get their name wrong." You know, you can understand why someone subconsciously is doing that and how harmful and wrong that can be. So let's try and I just wanted to shine a spotlight on that and and say, well, let's call it out. If we ever hear it and we ever see it, it's really, really important we call that out. And do check out Mary's story, Mary Abiemi from Glasgow. Uh, you can find that uh, online. We can uh, we can put a little link to that wow. in, the, um, in the show notes of this podcast. Got to keep a spotlight on, eh, Simone? Absolutely. Call it out. Always call it out. We have got some amazing high fives this week. You know we love a high five. Oh, and love, love a high, a high five. five. We've it- got Zulu87 on Instagram. I love that. Um, it's just put a house up for sale. Let us know. To be honest, it's going to sell quick. All houses seem to be it's selling. Go. Houses, um, camper vans, dogs, all going through the roof, literally. Um, <laughs> Kalika, <laughs> fabulous Kalika, part of the Northern Power Women ah. Massive. Her high five would be starting Ramadan last Tuesday and starting to fast. Her and her mum walked out 10,000 steps, handing out packages for friends and family with food to break their fast. How lovely is that? That is all, real paper oh. and stuff. Thank you, Kalika. I love that. Well, I t- well, definitely Kalika, Ramadan and Mubarak to you. I want to say a big hello to my ex next door neighbours who I always miss around Ramadan because Abdul and Zanira would always bring over food every single day for iftar and we used to have the most wonderful time now I hadn't been fasting during the day I still managed to stuff myself every single evening with the amazing food and they'd invite us around so Abdul and Kalika oh, Abdul, well from Kalika thank you to Abdul and Zanira oh I miss you and your amazing food yeah now you're hungry aren't you now, now I'm starving <laughs> yeah another one of the team our lovely Emma Emma Mason her high five is for Mason Jr 
uh, 11-year-old Noah, who last week ran his 100th mile of the year. He's ran one mile every day for 100 days and raised £1,600 <sighs> for the JDRF, which is Research into Juvenile Diabetes, which he was diagnosed with during COVID, uh, which is massively stressful for RM. Um, and she's super proud. And that is her high five for the whole year so far for our Emma. Um, we've got Natalie Jameson. Noah, it's got, I yeah. just want to pause a minute and say, Noah, you are incredible. Isn't it? That is really a fan. I can't get my 13 year old to walk to the end of the road. Genuinely, that is an amazing, amazing achievement. And I want to say a high five to Emma for homeschooling <laughs> three kids during this pandemic. One has been diagnosed with diabetes. You are amazing. Your bucket must be the size of the Titanic <laughs> lady, but you always hold it together that you're oh, amazing. We've got uh, Natalie Jamieson, who is hashtag ladies who launch Manchester Tech. She's launched the UK's first fintech financial services technology sales bootcamp apprenticeship program with her awesome new colleagues, Beverly and Jame, uh, Jamie. Um, Jaime, sorry, there we go. Sorry, forgive me if I... Uh, mispronounced I'm calling myself out um, Amanda Newman from Accenture she's high-fiving Paul Porter for being such a wonderful male ally and for bringing so much value to the career mum community if you're not part of that community it's on LinkedIn it's on Facebook it's absolutely so supportive and so encouraging and positive um, I love this one Alice Choi is it wrong to high five an industrial sized bar of Cadbury's fruit and nut midweek? Absolutely not. No. Definitely not. No, it's not, not Alice. No. <laughs> and finally, Hayley Ward, seeing her team give praise and support to one another. It's really important to have a positive culture at work where we help each other to overcome the lows and celebrate the highs. So, massive high five to all of you for sharing your high five. So, and big one to Alice. I hope you shared the industrial sized bar of fruit. I hope you did. Didn't Alice? I hope you did not. <laughs> so me. Thank you so much. Very, very, very brilliant to hear all your uh, fantastic high fives here on the Northern Power Women podcast. Thank you so, so much for listening. Thank you to b-her.io for sponsoring season three of the podcast. Get on that website, get yourself registered, make sure your voice is heard, please. And Simone and I will be back with you, of course, very shortly. The next episode coming your way on Monday, April the 26th. Until then, this is the Northern Power Women podcast and it's a What Goes On Media production. <laughs> <laughs>